call me Artina. I'm totally fine. And I'm really happy to be here to share one of my true loves, um, qualitative research and specifically qualitative thematic analysis. I just want to put it out there that this is not normal for me to stand behind a podium. <laughs> I'm usually over there with you all and uh, engaging in small group work. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn it off. This is what happens when you're I'm not a tech person really. But again, to demonstrate, this isn't really my style to stand behind a podium, but um, we've been asked to do that for reporting purposes, so I'm a bit of a rule follower, so I'm going to have to follow that rule. So welcome again. Uh, I'm really happy to share um, one of my um, areas of expertise and loves, uh, which is qualitative research, but in, in, in um, and specifically qualitative thematic analysis today. So just to give you a sense of what we'll be doing together, we're going to start with just a check-in. I want to see where you are right now at this moment. I know that you've had um, some instruction already on how to take your interview data and to code it. So we'll just do a quick check-in, make sure we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to lecture um, and just kind of covering some of the things that already you've read about in the Saldana and um, the, um, I forgot the other author's name, um, well, the other, the other reading that you had, uh, moving from codes to themes. So uh, we'll be talking about that. And then we'll actually have an example and a chance to practice how we can take some extracts from our <coughs> interview transcripts and code them to get us to a theme, to move up into the level of themes. And then hopefully we'll have some time and I'll go ahead and demonstrate uh, Google Highlight, which is a free add-on into the Google uh, Suite. And usually, as you read in your reading, uh, sometimes qualitative researchers will use software to do this coding process to, have to generate themes. But those software tend to be expensive and hard to learn. There's a bit of a learning curve. So uh, there's, you can obviously use Word. You can obviously use paper and pen, colorful pipe, uh, markers, highlighters. But another approach is Google Highlights, so I'll teach you that as well. And I know some of you have already started your analysis process, so you might say, ah, too late for that, but for future use. So some learning objectives for the day. Uh, first, students will identify the different levels of codes. Second, students will explain how codes are used to develop themes. And students will participate or practice developing one theme given a data set and a set of codes. Okay, so that's our day. All right, so let's do a check-in. I'm going to have three questions, but the way we're going to do this, I'm actually going to have you uh, do a poll. You can see on the board, there's a guest Wi-Fi, so if you're not already hooked in, and you can use your laptops here or your cell phones. I will say, if you, you're going to be texting, so if you don't have like a text plan that will allow for this, please don't use your phones, because I don't want to get invoices later with, uh, you didn't pay for my <laughs> texting bill. But you can certainly use the internet or you can use your cell phone, either one. If you use the internet, I want you to go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, and then forward slash Samkian. If you're using your phone, you can go, to, you can text my, my last name to the number 37607. So go ahead and get set up there just to um, get us going, and then I'll, I'll move to the first poll question. So let's go with this first one. What words would you use to describe qualitative data analysis? So think of a word or two. Well, it is tedious. Descriptive, oh, I see soft. I'm wondering if that's as opposed to the hard sciences, <laughs> quantitative research. Um, personal, very informative, subjective. All right, great. Let's go to the next one. This is a multiple choice, so you're going to hit A, B, C, or D. The question is, or the prompt is, a priori codes are. Labels that are developed inductively while reading through the data, 
labels that are developed prior to analysis, or codes that are often derived from the literature, or both B and C. Sometimes the in real time makes me wonder, are people changing their answers? <laughs> All right, so I'm glad that we're on the bottom part of this graphic, right? Not the inductively while reading through the data. We don't, uh, a priori codes aren't inductively developed, right? They're deductive codes. They are developed prior to analysis. So a little mnemonic device, a priori, right? So prior to the analysis, prior to starting your um, analysis process, you might develop some codes that you already know, oftentimes from the literature, okay? So we often come up with these, not just from the literature, but oftentimes from the literature. That helps us shape. These are some things I think I know about this topic. So the right answer here is both B and C, right? They're both developed prior to the study and oftentimes coming from the literature. And by the way, if, if there are any questions, as, as you heard at the beginning, please feel free to jump in, raise your hand, and, and ask. Mm. Okay. <laughs> All right, our next one. Emergent codes are labels that are developed inductively while reading through the data, labels that are developed prior to the analysis, sometimes called empirical, open, or in vivo codes, and both A and C. Did I make it too easy? <laughs> All right, good. So most of you were saying both A and C, and that's absolutely correct. So emergent codes are those that we develop as we're reading the data. So we read it, we see things that we might not have thought about from the literature or from prior to uh, beginning the analysis process, and we code those as we go. But also, there, there's different names that we use. We methodologists like to you know, confuse you by using all these different words for it. So sometimes you'll hear it being called empirical codes or open codes. Some people will call it in vivo. In vivo codes are a specific kind of emergent code that uses the actual words of participants as the code. So it's like verbatim, you know, phrases or words that the participants have used. So both A and C. All right, and finally, this is a, a short answer, so take a couple of sentences or, or a phrase to help answer this. How do codes facilitate analysis? more easily, making data easier to look at, because you know you're going to have a lot of narrative data. Okay, so helping to find overarching themes by merging, right? Categorizing feelings, emotions, thoughts, structure of information, so structuring your lots of um, narrative data. Organizing, categorizing, okay, great. Putting our data into categories, fantastic. Okay, so multiple people can sort through the data with the same themes in mind, sometimes different themes in mind, right? That's what makes it interpretive. Ah, uh, helps us answer our research question. We haven't mentioned the research question yet so far. And that's really important. At the end of the day, what you're hoping to do is to answer your research questions, yes? In fact, I tell all of my students, take a sticky note, write your research questions on it, and post it wherever you are normally, 
on your car dashboard without getting into a car accident, <laughs> on your mirror in the morning where you, know, you can see it at your computer, at your desk. Because at the end of the day, you want to answer those research questions. That's the primary function of analysis. But we do all of this coding stuff, right, to get us there. All right. Excellent. So what is thematic analysis then? You've talked about how to take your data, which is lots of narrative information. You've interviewed several people, and they might be saying different things about the same topics. You've asked them the same questions probably, maybe probed for some additional questions. But at the end of the day, you have a lot of different information, lots of different kinds of ways of responding to your questions, your interview questions, which were intended to help you answer the larger research questions. Okay, so what is it that you're finding in your data? And that's really the question that you're asking yourself when you're doing thematic analysis. So I'm going to use an analogy of the tree. If you want to understand what it is, if you look at it from afar, it's going to be hard to put answers to what it is. You actually have to break it into its component parts. In order to be able to see what it really truly is, you have to break it. We, have to, we call it reducing the data. Right? You have to reduce this tree or this sea of trees into its component parts. And that's what you're, you're looking for, the kinds of things that this overarching data is trying to tell you. So in this case, you might find that there are branches, there are leaves, there is a fruit. The fruit has certain textures, right? It's orange, it's kind of like a soft texture. Um, the fruit is round, and there are seeds inside, right? This is an orange tree. So we have to unpack it. We have to reduce it to its component parts. And then we put it back together to, to derive our theme. This is an orange tree. Now, we could look at this in a different way. We could wonder, what function does it serve? Right? So if we're thinking about subjectivity and interpretation, it's not like we are going off. When we say subjective, we don't mean going off on your own and making something up. Right? What we're talking about here is that you have assumptions, and the reading talks about this. You have assumptions that you bring to bear in any time you do a study. Well, I might not care about what it is. I might care about the function it serves. And so your question might be, what's the function? Now, from the literature, you have some ideas of the functions for trees, right? You might know that, for example, uh, they serve potentially for food. They sometimes serve for timber. So to make paper and, and other kinds of um, um, products, like wooden furniture, etc., You might know that it provides oxygen for us, right? So you have some ideas already that are, are brewing from, from the get-go, right? You don't come into our research completely blank. You have ideas. That's what the literature is there for. And sure enough, you observe and you find that, yeah, so they're, they're, the food are picked here. They're organized. They are taken to a packing house. They're packed. Function, food consumption. Okay. So you've broken it into its component parts to help us get to what the function is. Here, for this, in this case, it's food consumption. And I had this in my thoughts before. I kind of already knew that trees sometimes are there to provide food for us. Right? The literature helped me see that a priori. Right? But you know what? I might do my study and find that there might be another function for the tree. I might see that there are a lot near playgrounds. And there are a lot of kids around them. They play hide and seek. And oftentimes, they climb them. So the function you might find in an emergent way is that the orange tree actually serves as a tree for your kids to climb. This happened in uh, my son's preschool when he, when he started preschool. There was a nice big lemon tree in the playground. And it wasn't even a week of preschool when the director of the preschool sent home a note <coughs> and said, please tell your son that the tree is not for climbing. <laughs> right? Okay, so not in that school, right? Not in this because it's liability issues. But certainly, you might find that there might be trees that are perfect to climb. And that's not something you would have thought of. That's not something the literature told you. 
It's something that emerged from your ability to see, break apart the tree's functions. Any questions so far? All right, so I want to respond to some of the points about this being soft or subjective, right? This whole process of thematic analysis. There is interpretation. And we do know that interpretation is not an exact science. And you know what? Qualitative researchers don't think it should be. Because we all come to the research with our own lenses, with our own theoretical underpinning assumptions. And that's OK. Bless you. Thank you. So what we want to know is, as a reader, we want to know, did you do your due diligence to really analyze the data carefully and systematically? And the coding process, by the way, also helps you do that. I didn't see that in the um, how does it serve for analysis purposes poll, but that's really actually one of its purposes, to help us when we're breaking apart into its component parts, we're doing it systematically so that I did see to help us quantify. How does quantifying help with making sure that our work is rigorous. It's not like just our own, what we want. So, like for me, like I have like some codes that I've developed and then being able to see how many, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, so uh, I've developed some codes and then now that I'm able to like look through all of my data, I'm able to see how many times these codes are, are emerging and popping up and kind of keep a tally. So I guess if I actually had like a, a pretty good sized sample, then I could kind of do some type of like quantitative analysis and be like, oh, okay, you know, 50% of my people are saying this or whatever. Okay, great. So you can take, you can tally up the number of times your codes appear. And what you're saying is if you have a large enough sample, you could do some statistical work and some descriptive work, right? Um, but what if you don't have a large enough sample? Can you still use those numbers? I mean, I'm still able to, to really understand, like, okay, a lot of people that I'm talking to, in, in I'm doing research on education, so I'm able to understand that a lot of people are having some of these same education problems, and uh, these same themes are, are reoccurring, and it's, it's, in my mind, it's prevalent. Okay, fantastic. Other comments about this? How do, how do codes, and maybe counting codes, how do those help us to make sure that our study's done well? Yeah, well, I guess my kind of question about the matter is, um, like a problem that I ran into is, is it's so easy to interpret, you know, the people's language and, and what they write, or, or what they say, that I keep on, I'm inclined to always go back to the interpretation drawing board, mm -hmm. and kind of always, like, interpret, interpret, and I'm like, okay, no, I, I should really stick to my original interpretation. So I, I guess I would wonder, at what point do you say you should stick to your codes and, and really just go with them? Mm -hmm. What are people's thoughts about that? Can you go into an interpretation spiral where you're not sure if it's really what the participants intended to say? People are nodding, yeah. But what might be a way to help avoid that or... It seems to me if you were... You know, that, right? Sorry. <laughs> I believe that goes back to how you conducted your interview. Mm -hmm. So when you're in front of who you're the interviewee, you know, body language, sort of like the intangibles that you can pick up on and you can even question them about it to get clarification. So I just I think it all stems back to the interview process. Okay, great. So two things you mentioned actually. The first is the actual data collection process. What did you do in the data collection? How did you pick up on markers or other kinds of body language that would help you with your more accurate interpretation? And then the second thing you mentioned is to actually ask them, right? Am I hitting the nail on the head? Is this about what you're thinking when you're, when you're saying this? Am I interpreting you correctly, right? That's another topic altogether, and that's a way to make sure that our work is credible. We talk about credibility and qualitative research. One way is to do what, what you're suggesting is member checking. We call that member checking, where you might go back after you've had a, have, have a bit of an idea of what you want to say, going back to your participants and saying, here's what I'm thinking. Does this jive with how you're seeing things as well? Does that help? So you might need to go back. I don't know if you have time to do that in this particular context, but in the larger world of research, you probably do want to go back. You probably do want to do member checking so that you're, you don't drive down into an interpretive, interpretive black hole, so to speak. 
Does that help? Thank Other you. questions, comments? from the last academy, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he did say one suggestion was to have a colleague listen to the to the same um, audio and see if they're interpreting the same thing that you are. And so if they can see what you um, concluded, then it's likely like true or not. Absolutely. That's another strategy that we use for credibility, to boost our credibility. That's called peer review. So member checking is different from peer review in that member checking, you actually go back to the participants that you interviewed, and maybe you don't go back to all of them. I know you had five uh, participants, but in a larger study, you might have 20. You're not going to want to go back to all 20, but some key informants, we call them. You might go back for member checking. But what you're mentioning is different in that you go to a peer. You might go to a colleague. You might go to a professor who's working with you on it. You might go to someone else who, who knows the topic, right? Not just anybody, but helps you kind of see. There are other strategies as well. Going back to the data collection that you were mentioning, if you triangulate your data, so for example, if you interview them and you watch them, right, depending on your topic, you have more sources of data to help you make sure that your interpretations are more solid. So there's a, there's a variety of different strategies. So far, we've just mentioned three, which is Member checking, peer review, and triangulation. There are others. With peer review, do you ever find, like, in your research experience, that it's like a um, with with peer review? Do you ever find that uh, it's kind of like a, a too many cooks in the kitchen kind of thing? Like, that's a great question. Um, I so I serve on a lot of committees as a chair to my students. And I do think that sometimes when you have too many competing ideas, it can be, it can stifle more than it can facilitate. I do think having one or two people working with you is not too many cooks in the kitchen. In fact, when I work with my students, we'll look at the data together and I'll ask questions. And my students will often say, oh, I never thought about it that way. Or, you know what, this is what I'm seeing. Are you seeing this? And then I'll say, I'm totally seeing that too. And so I think one or two key people, probably one is enough as well, they can really help you. And when I was going through my doctoral program, my chairs did that with me. I would get on the phone with them and they, I would talk through what I'm finding, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking, and they would really help me kind of contextualize it and say, yes, I am seeing that. That's actually called this thing. And then I'd go back into the literature to find that thing because they were just more knowledgeable about mm -hmm. the concepts from the theories. So at that point in my uh, trajectory. So, Yes, I think you're, the answer, the short answer to your question is yes, it, it, you can possibly fall into too many cooks. But it, if you have one or two, you shouldn't. Not in this case, but let's say you're in a case like that where you have two students, you know, like going over the, the information. Like, do you end up telling them the research question? Because I feel like when I'm going through mine, I'm like trying not to, like, I feel like I don't want to and like look for the answers there. You know what I mean? Like I'm not my bias of wanting those answers. You know what I mean? I hope like so. Do your students know the research question when they're going through the data? Great question. And yes, you always know your research questions beforehand, right? That's what that's what's starting your process from the get go. And as I as I said, I always say put your research questions everywhere. Post them so that. Because one of the things that sometimes happens, especially in qualitative research, is that this other interesting thing starts to come up and you follow that interesting thing, and before you know it, it's not even related to your research questions. So just a quick example, when I was doing my doctoral work, it was an ethnographic study, I was in a school, and I'm kind of like a late technology adopter. You might not know it if you see me, but I, I'm like a late bloomer. I didn't have a cell phone until like my last year in college. Um, I am. Older, so like way, way long time ago, but cell phones weren't that, that you know, um, common. But one of the things I was noticing when I was doing my field work was all the students had cell phones in the classrooms. I was in a high school, 
and they were texting, and they were texting under the table, and they were texting without looking, and all my notes were, oh my goodness, girl in the front is texting, and oh, the girl, boy in the back is texting, and he's not even looking at the phone. How is he texting? How does he know where the letters are? And I had to step back and say, texting is not my question. That's not my research question, so I better redirect myself. So now, to back to your question about the research questions, you need research questions to guide you. What you're mentioning is, if you have an answer to it already, that's a quite different thing, right? So this takes us back to the original point about how coding helps us analyze. When you're counting, when you start to see that, you know, I think my hunch for this topic is that the answer is X. But when you're coding and you're counting and you're seeing, oh, actually, most of the people are talking about Y. They're not talking about X. So the ability to count the typicality of a kind of comment in your transcripts is one way to stop yourself from answering the question the way you wanted to answer the question. Does that make sense? So typicality and atypicality in your data corpus is actually one of the reasons why we do coding because it removes us from jumping straight to the answer. If we went straight to, this is an orange tree, and its function is food, food consumption, we've missed a whole layer of work. We've already answered the question, right? So we might miss out on this, because our initial conceptions are, and our initial answer to the question have taken over. So coding and moving, and a lot of students find the coding process tedious. Actually, someone said that, right, in our word cloud. And it's true, it is tedious, but it is one way to make sure that we're breaking it apart so that we're not just jumping to the answer. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Yeah. Shouldn't you go in, is it totally inappropriate? Is it totally inappropriate to go in with uh, predetermined assumptions, though? I don't think we can avoid it, can we? I don't think we can, we all go in with assumptions, theoretical understandings of the way the world works, right? The answers to our questions, we might already have hunches. The question is how do you analyze in a way that is systematic, careful, rigorous, and in fact, another strategy for helping to make sure that, so we talked about member checking, we talked about peer review. We talked about triangulation. Another approach to make sure that we're not just going to the answer we wanted to find is to actively look for disconfirming evidence. So this is an orange tree. I'm going to actively look to find evidence that suggests it's not. And if I can't find that evidence, then I can more solidly say, I'm right. It's an orange tree. So that's another strategy to increase, to boost our credibility. And so it moves us out of the realm of subjectivity. And that's oftentimes what qualitative research is, is denounced for, right? It's too subjective. You found what you wanted to find already. But there are processes behind the curtain. A lot of the stuff we've, we are just doing behind the curtain, right? It, they're, they're not things that we are showing to our, um, to our um, readers. Now, our reading talks about explaining how you did it to your readers so that the readers see that, oh, they took these steps, they did member checks, they talked to a, uh, their professor, and the professor actually looked at the data. Um, they actively tried to find alternative answers. So by doing those things, you're just boosting your, the, the, the validity of your, of your work, of the finding. Does that help? I think, were you going to ask the question too? No. Earlier. Um, <laughs> I was actually, I had this, oh, turn it on. Mm -hmm. hello, okay, I actually was just going to ask if um, having, an, like, having an idea of like a hypothesis going into a research endeavor, if that stifles the researcher um, in terms of avoiding like cognitive bias and things like that. Great question, and that's oftentimes, so the question of hypotheses, it, there, we do qualitative research very differently from how we do quantitative. Quantitative research, we come in with, an hypo with a hypothesis and we test it. We simply test it. Mm -hmm. What helps with qualitative research is that we always come in with hunches, 
I like to use the word hunches rather than hypotheses, just to distinguish the difference between qual and quant. We have hunches, we all do, right? But the, the work of a qualitative researcher is, again, to not to necessarily just look there in a narrow way, but because we're inductively coding, because we're using open and emergent codes, we're also going to hopefully be open to these other ideas. Is that not what you were asking? Sorry. Can we use Sorry. <laughs> I guess that makes sense in terms of exploratory research, but I'm just wondering like, if you're taking more of an explanatory approach, um, if that still stands. Good question. So the tenets of qualitative research are that, it, that it's exploratory. So if your intention is not to do an exploratory study, then everything going back all the way to your research questions, to your, to your instruments would be very different. Your instruments would be very structured. They wouldn't have semi-structured, you wouldn't have semi-structured protocols where they would be open to probing, for example. Everything would sort of fall more in a structured realm. And there are ways to do that in using qualitative approaches. So the only qualitative structured approach would be to ask open-ended questions, but in a very structured way. So asking the same question to the same, uh, in the same order to everyone, right? And then you have some ability to make comparisons. The drawback to that is, to your point, that you're constraining mm -hmm. yourself. Because if you don't have the ability to probe during the interview, then you might not find these other ideas that you didn't think about before. Because if they say, oh, and yeah, my kids like to climb it, you can't go with that. You've got to go back to the questions that you had originally in the structured protocol and stick to those. So yes, the structured approach tells only part of the story because it's so shaped by a more narrow perspective, whereas the, the strength of qualitative research is the openness of it, is its exploratory nature. Does that make sense? All right, so we know it's not an exact science, but it should never be, right? All right, so just a little quick review of how we move up in through the levels of coding. So I know that you've had an opportunity to try out open coding or emergent coding. You've had the opportunity to do it in a more sort of strict exploratory fashion. You've also had the opportunity to try it out with a priori codes where the codes were already given and you just applied that, so very deductively. So what's the next level? Once you've coded your data in this way, you might have a bunch of codes. Well, you want to group them. And so one way to do that is to see if some of these codes actually connect to each other in a concept or a particular idea. So when we do that, when we do that, we might have a bunch of categories, and underneath them, we have sets of codes. So we might have a priori codes, we might have emergent codes, and those things kind of combine into under a category. Now, what you've practiced before, I, I believe, is a priori coding and emergent coding in silos. So not combining them. What you will most likely do in any qualitative research project is to combine them. Because you'll have these hunches from before, you'll have a literature review that'll give you a sense of the a priori codes. But as you're reading, because we try to be explanatory, I mean, exploratory, excuse me, we want to find other things that we didn't anticipate before. So we'll add open codes, we'll add it, those emergent codes. So the combination of those two is actually what is the best approach, the ideal in a qualitative um, study. And then what you might find is, oh, well, you know, these, three, these first three categories seem to be talking about this one idea or this one concept and thus pattern. Okay? So you might pull up the first three categories into, you might see a pattern in those first three categories and say, that's my theme one. Now, poor little category over there is left out. Okay? Sometimes it goes into another theme. It might be in a different section of your report. I think you have to come up with three themes in your study. So maybe those other, that category with those other codes goes into a second theme or a third theme. Maybe it goes away completely. It just is unimportant. Maybe it doesn't answer your research questions. And I know that can be really heartbreaking because you spend so much time coding it and you feel like, gotta use it. Well, sometimes we don't. 
So some of the back curtain stuff, just to preview for you and to manage your expectations, sometimes you don't use them because they don't fit into the story. They don't answer your questions. Another way to represent this is in your Saldana reading. And what he talks about here that's useful, it's basically what I had here but flipped to its side. Except that what I also like about what he includes here is that it goes from the real, which is your data, really close to your data, to the abstract, where you're generating up into a theme. It goes from the particular to the general. Okay, So that, that uh, representation I really like. And now, we go all the way to theory because we're generating theory with, our, with what we're um, actually producing. And, so, and oftentimes, I'd actually add that the, you probably have multiple themes for a theory. Another way to talk about it, and then we're up, we'll actually do um, some more active learning, um, is that this is a hierarchy. We move from the data, which is the particular, up into the general. We move from the um, concrete to the abstract. Okay? And by doing that, we're going from these really discrete codes that we're actually chunking uh, our data into and then labeling them, right? Very sort of like close to the data. We might categorize those into categories. We might go back and forth. Like you might start with something that's, you know, broader and you, you say, oh, there's too many of those. So we need to break it up into other things. So you go back down, and then you go back up to themes and patterns, and then ultimately, what are your findings? What's the assertions and the propositions you're making? So this is not intended to, to, to demonstrate it as a sort of linear process. In fact, it's very iterative. It's intended not to be linear. You're going back and forth, back and forth, and your reading talks about that. Ron and Clark. There we go. <laughs> I had lost their names. Mm -hmm. And Ron and Clark talk about that, right? That it's not, you don't do this one time. Coding is not a one time deal. All right, so let's review. I want to have you, uh, you all take a moment just with uh, a partner, talk about the answers to, this, to these questions. What are the different levels of coding? Uh, what is a pattern slash theme? How do you identify these patterns and themes? Why is it problematic to talk about patterns or themes, quote, emerging? Okay, to help you with this last question, how do theoretical frameworks shape what we find? And how is thematic analysis active versus passive? So go ahead and just check in with a partner next to you, find someone, or three people is fine as well, and answer these questions based on the readings and what we've just talked about. All right. What's up? Um, I guess I can take notes. Yeah, I have to leave it on. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what are the different levels of coding? Um, I mean, I think of that flow chart she kind of showed. And this is all it's so obviously this and the flow chart she showed. So this is like the the like I guess this is the different levels of coding. I mean Okay, so I guess that's it. I mean, the way I interpret it is just like you have a uh, category that's subcategory. You have codes being subcategories. Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> What yeah, what the codes fall under? Like, like how you categorize the codes. Right. Um, for me, I just kind of looked at my codes and I felt as though they matched. Yeah, it was it wasn't a hard process for me. It was just yeah. more or less like. Oh, you have yeah. to do it naturally, like you can't really force it. Yeah. Mine's was pretty easy because it's centered around financial literacy. So let's say for instance if you're talking about financial aid, you're talking about another program, you're talking about another program, that would be categorized by 
my group can speak for themselves about what we spoke about, but would you say that transcribing is also a form of coding? Ooh, why do you ask that question? Because I feel like transcribing is like the most basic. I feel like a five-year-old child can also transcribe a research. Like if it was just like recorded. So I don't know, I asked my group and um, they said yes, but I don't know, I feel like it's not coding. Go ahead, do you want to answer? So I feel like, um, like, like if you literally like words being transcribed, I don't think that's like necessarily coding. But I think if you're adding like, I, I don't know, like in the reading we did the naturalistic coding. Like I think that can be coding if that makes sense. But I don't know. Can you describe what you mean by the naturalistic coding, just so I have context? Yeah, for sure. Um, so like for example, we were reading about how um, naturalistic coding is like including things like you know like. Um, Subject, yeah, subject like touched their head or looked uncomfortable or um, like physical movements or um, non-verbal cues and things like that. Yeah, so uh, we, we sometimes also call that low inference, right, mm -hmm. low inference descriptions. So when you're transcribing your interviews, and Ron and Clark talk about this too, that when you transcribe your interviews, if you do it yourself, your analytic process gets jump-started in a sense that you are, now you are doing a one-to-one, -one, right? You are in, in quite the naturalistic coding fashion. You're using their words and you're just typing their words, right? It's verbatim. That's the intention of a transcription, right? When you do it yourself, you're going through that first step in the, there's a, there's a really nice table in that reading that talks about how you can kind of, how the procedure of thematic analysis is, which is first, read all your data. Right? There, this is contested. Not everybody agrees with that. I do. I tend to agree with that. You want to start analysis even before you have all of your data transcribed. But the first process is, once you have it all, read through it. And kind of think about your research. Put your research questions on one side. Read your data. And then think about what is there in your data. Because now you've kind of removed yourself from the field. You're not interviewing anymore. You want to look at the whole data corpus. Transcribing your interviews actually jump starts that process. 
because you're getting super close to your data. You're actually listening and typing, listening and typing. And in that process, you're actually doing that first round of getting familiar with your data. So I wouldn't call it coding per se, because coding is technically the assignment of labels to chunks of the data that you've transcribed, those words that you've actually typed. But it is an analytic process, nonetheless. I have some folks who are, I, I teach mostly uh, working professionals, so they're busy principals and counselors and teachers, and they don't, transcription takes a while. They don't want to do it. So oftentimes they'll pay and just get external transcription services. They have more work to do getting familiar with their data. The students of mine who decide to transcribe their own data, they do a lot of the work at the front end. But you know what? They know their data really well by the time it's all transcribed. So you have a choice. You can transcribe your own data. I think most of you probably will or have already. Um, or in the research world, you could send it out. And there's a lot of online services now that do a phenomenal job. They'll send it back to you within 24 hours. You pay a little hefty penny, but you get it. And it's all word for word. The work is now on the back end with those transcription services because that first step of analysis, you haven't done, if that makes sense. But coding is the actual process of labeling those chunks of narrative data from the transcriptions. Is that a hand back there? No. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. You're getting your stuff in. <laughs> um, so I guess one theme that kind of emerged for us was that like we have a general idea of the four like the four things, yeah. but trying to decipher like the difference between categories and themes because they both seem to be like subgroups of codes. Mm -hmm. So so really trying to understand like where we should be drawing the, the differences between one, two, three, and four. Yes, okay, that's great. That's a great question. So you're talking about this here. Yes. And you're saying between two and three, it yeah. gets murky. Even even between okay. three, and, or even just trying to understand four to the full extent. But yeah, sure. between two and three, I think it, it's a little murky, at least in, in the experience that we had here. Great, and that's actually the point of today, right? We're actually gonna practice trying to move from that to the, to the next levels. Um, so we'll get to that in a, in a second, but anyone else want to talk about the key takeaways from your discussions? And then we'll spend more time on how do we move to themes. So um, in that, the, the one slide with the one, two, three, four, yeah, so um, at the bottom it describes discrete uh, or empirical codes, and I was just wondering what the difference is between empirically coding and then, I guess, sort of just paraphrasing what is said on the raw data, or if there's even a difference, and what's significant about that. So paraphrasing what is there in... You mean in the code itself, or in the label itself, or do you mean as a report? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, do you mean, so coding is when you attach a label to a set of uh, words, right, a chunk of data. Um, paraphrasing, do you mean paraphrasing and making that the code? the label, or do you mean paraphrasing on another piece of paper, like this is what I hear? Yeah, so, as in the code just looks almost like a shortened version of the raw data. Is that, say, coding wrong then? So the codes are generally more, um, they're more minute than a paraphrase. They're literally like labels. Sometimes in vivo codes, will have the words of participants. Like, for example, if you hear a lot of people saying um, something like... Um, motivation. Motivation is key. Yeah. Motivation is key. And you, you hear people saying that. Motivation is key. And they're using those exact words. Motivation is key. Motivation is key. So you might say, oh, motivation is key. Those three words are now your in vivo code. So you might use the words of your participants as a label, 
Um, but in terms of paraphrasing what one person said, that wouldn't be a code. Now, what I will say is, after your interview, it's a great idea to take a moment and do a reflection. What is your general sense of what the interviewee just said to you? And in, in a way, that's paraphrasing that interview, interviewee's co um, comments. But when we're coding, remember, we're doing it across different people, or sometimes across the same person at multiple times. So it would have to be, the in vivo code would have to be something that people say in pretty much the same way. Motivation is key, motivation is key, motivation is key. And if more people than, than not say those three words together, then it becomes a code. Does that make sense? Yes. Other, uh, other comments about what you found, uh, what you talked about here? Why do Brown and Clark talk about um, it being a problem when people, when people say the codes emerged or the findings emerged? Isn't qualitative research supposed to be emergent? Isn't that the whole idea? Anyone else want to contribute? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so why, do, why does your reading, Brown and Clark, say that uh, it's problematic to talk about patterns and themes as being emergent? Um, is it because when, if, if you notice, if you, then you start mentioning these themes or these patterns in your questions or when you're asking them, could that possibly be why? If you're in your questions to the interviewees? Yeah, like, do you, like say, um, you start giving examples in your and you start saying certain words to them, and so then they just repeat them back to you. Oh, okay. So, so, therefore, the, so therefore, these codes just keep on repeating. Is that, is that maybe what you're getting at? Yes, yeah, so not quite. But you, what you're talking about is like leading in the interview, right? If the process of the interview is really critical. You have to make, make sure you're not leading the participant into where you want to go. But some people describe the coding process as emergent. Like, oh, it just emerged. So not in the data collection phase, but when you're, when you're doing the analysis. Why is that problematic? Do you want to chime in? Or do you want to chime in? Hello. Okay. Um, I think it kind of goes back to the whole subjectivity thing where you're kind of viewing um, the transcript through your specific theoretical framework and that might not really represent what maybe the participants were trying to say. Oh, okay. So you have a theoretical framework. <coughs> Um, and if you, ha you have to be careful with that, right? It's, it's helpful, it helps you shape the kinds of codes you might use, but you have to be careful with it so that it doesn't take over. But the whole concept of it emerging makes it seem like you have no theoretical framework. That you actually came in like with a total blank slate. Did you want to chime in as well? I, mean, I, I think you kind of are like hitting the nail on the head is that if we're pretending that like we're blank slate, like we're not really checking or, or we're not really being forthcoming about our biases and, and what theoretical frameworks were in our mind. And I guess my own narrative experience is that, you know, when I'm trying to do my research, I'm like, okay, here's all, all of my ideas and frameworks and I'm just looking at like confirming them and I'm kind of like, okay, if I, if I was being shady, I would be like, yeah, you know, these are, these ideas are emerging, but I'm not saying, hey, this was the idea I had coming in from my social class or whatever. Good. So both of you were talking about, um, now, in the interview process, we don't want to lead to that. Right. But if we do a really good job in the interview process of the data collection process of not leading, in the interpret interpretation process, we can still potentially be shaped by our, our theories, right? So we want to be careful with that. And at the same time, we are, we are, we have to be honest about the fact that we are coming in with hunches. We have a theoretical framework. It's not magic, in other words, right? The data just doesn't present itself and like leap off the page. The themes don't just come up. You actually have to do something, right? The coding process, the categorizing process, those are all active strategies that we use to analyze. So making sure that you know that is helpful in when you're talking about what you did, representing it that way, right? Representing it as an active process that you've engaged in. 
All right, so let's take an example and do a little bit of practice. Let's say we have this study on student engagement. And the title of the report is something like, How to Engage Students, colon, What College Students Self-Report as Helpful for Engagement. Okay? And the research question here was something like, What do first-year college students believe facilitates their engagement in their courses? Okay, so nicely situated in a qualitative question because it's about what they believe, right? You're after what they, what they think about, what they self-report. So when we're at that first discrete level of the coding process, we might see a bunch of different kinds of responses to the question of, can you please uh, complete the, the, the sentence, I am engaged in class when? So a bunch of different people saying different things. Some of them are saying, ooh, I, I love it when the content is interesting to me. The content really engages me. Other people saying, oh, when the instructor puts us in small groups, that's really engaging. Other people saying, I love lectures. Others saying, clickers, when they use clickers, that's really engaging. Ah, here's an in vivo code. I like the professor. So in quotes, because those were the actual words that uh, several of the people used, right? And finally, games when we get to play games in the class. That's engaging. All right, so these are the codes that we have. Um, some of them, I'll tell you, are a priori, and some of them are emergent. But don't worry about that. You don't have to worry about which ones are which. But what I want you to do is, using those codes on that slide, and I'll go back to them, what I want you to do is, you have a handout with uh, extracts of data. So it's not a full transcript. You've already done the part of pulling out a bunch of data chunks from your transcripts. And these are different people saying different things about what engages them. So what I want you to do is, in pairs, I want you to read through and with a, paper, with a pencil, just mark down the codes that we had in this slide. I'll put it back. And then what I want you to do is, as a pair, group the coded data into at least one larger category that subsumes the larger codes, the other codes. And then see if you can come up with a theme. So this is gonna go back to your question about where do we go from categories to how do we do that jump. So categorize the themes, group them together, and then come up with at least one theme. What's the pattern you see? What is an assertion you can make? Okay, so that's your task with that coded data, or uh, with the um, extracted data. And here are the codes I want to use. So go ahead and work with someone else just to help you. Um, only six codes, and you're applying it to these chunks of data. Keep in mind, remember, that while this is, this is kind of uh, not very natural, right, because I've already extracted a bunch, you can code multiple chunks more, with more than one code. So this is a little artificial in that most likely you'll probably code them with just one code. But normally with, you, with your interview uh, transcripts, you can take the same sentence and code it in two different ways for two different purposes. It probably won't happen here because of the way I've organized the activity, but I just want to note that this is kind of artificial in that way. All right, go ahead and work on that. All right, so we are going to move back into whole groups. I want to hear what you're talking about. Uh, I've heard a little tiny bit, and I'm really excited about what some of you are talking about. So um, let's talk about the data, and I have line numbers, I inserted line numbers just to make it easy for us to say, oh, the quote that starts on line blah, you know, um, it'll help facilitate us moving to that quote really quickly. What were some questions or challenges you had as you were coding the data, the extract? Again, this, these are extracts, right? Pulled from interviews. Yeah? Um, I kind of uh, found myself, I think we both did, asking the same question that Tyler did earlier, which is really kind of differentiating between level two and level three here uh, to the categories and the themes. Right. Okay, so um, you coded using these codes. Right. And then, did you categorize yet? Did you, did you lump codes together? Um, so when you say like, like categorizing as in like maybe people who like lecture, putting them all together under one. Ah, okay. Under so people who talk about lecture, putting them all together. Okay, so lecture. Is there any other code 
besides lecture that goes into that idea? Maybe content. Ooh, maybe content. Okay. Talk to me about that. Why did the, so the person who talked about content, the quote starts on page, on, on line number 33, right? Ever since I was nine, I wanted to be a microbiologist. So the thing that gets me to class and engaged in class is that I get to study just that now. So did you put that under, with, with lecture? So lecture and content, two quotes that kind of appear together. Did others do that as well? I, I think we also um, put content for I think line 27. Oh, 27? As well. Ah, yes. Just tell me what I want to know, right? Uh, tell me what you want me to know. I'm in college. I don't need to be doing games and having fun. The professor is clearly there because he has expertise, content, right? I want to hear what he has to say. So that's lecture, right? Could you double code that lecture and content? Yes. Maybe the first part of that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, My part. Yeah. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering, like, for example, like in that very um, excerpt that you mentioned, um, they're kind of bashing games, and I'm wondering if that still counts as a code within games. Ah, oh, good question. Okay, so we have two instances where they talk about something but not liking it, right? So in this case, uh, it's, I don't, don't give me games. I don't, I'm in college. I don't want games, right? So it's games, not so, not so good, right? Not games. No. Uh, so there's games yay, there's games no. And in this case, you might code it games. Nothing about games says games are good, right? That label, the code games, doesn't mean games good, right? So you could double code that, right? So that the, the one that starts on, on line 27, you could double or maybe triple code it. Content, lecture, games. Go for it. So could a code for that be like, um, like one code be um, games positive and another would be games negative? Ah, okay, like good. That. So now we're getting into, we've got games. Games here, games there, games everywhere. <laughs> but they're talking about games in different ways. This person's saying games, not so good. The other person, starting on, on line 30, games, 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 give me games, right? Games, yay. So now we have this idea to parse apart games into positive, negative. I love that. And oftentimes we'll do that as qualitative researchers. We'll say games yay, games no, right? And I'll use my own, you can use however, uh, whatever label you want, but I'll usually do games plus, games minus, right? In my code, because that'll help me know, oh, they're talking about games, but they don't like it. And actually the same kind of thing happens with uh, the one that starts on line 24. I hate when Dr. Ray lectures. It's like nonstop for two and a half hours. So it's lecture, but it's lecture bad. Versus, I am more focused when the professor lectures on line nine. So lecture plus, lecture minus. Yes. With coding that one, um, could it be possible to like blow that one out of proportion? Because maybe it's just Dr. Ray who just really sucks at lecturing. It's just really boring. Yeah, but like, maybe just like, like yeah, like a good like uh, probe that would be like, okay, is it Dr. Ray specifically that you don't like lecturing because he just puts you to sleep, or is it someone else, uh, or is it just lectures in general? I, I, could, yeah, like, could, could coding like you know could that be blown out of proportion simply because maybe it's Dr. Ray specifically? What a great question, and that's again it goes back to earlier your question of the interpretive like black hole, right? Mm -hmm. Are you saying that this person is is intending to say I hate lectures, period, or I just hate when so and so lectures, right? Because if the group back there was talking about well if it's the content is really interesting, then lecturing might be just fine, right? If you love the content, if you've wanted to study microbiology since you were nine, I got that, I, I made up this data, that's my son right there. He wants to, he's nine, he wants to be a microbiologist. So if you want to be a, a microbiologist since you were nine, you don't care how it's delivered. Give it to me, lecture, it to, lecture me or uh, do small groups, I don't care. So that group was talking about how even the ones that are talking about the content might also be about lecture. But now you're moving into, you've moved up from a more discrete place, right, to a more abstract place. So the question of, are you potentially interpreting something that might not be there, 
maybe it's just this professor that he doesn't like lecturing, but other professors he's fine with, right? Or she's fine with. So it go, it, that's a question then of context. If you do a good job in your interviews, by the way, this is where the ex exploratory is really powerful. If you know what you're doing and you can probe and say, oh, you know, you mentioned Dr. Ray. How about other professors? Do you like if other professors lecture? That takes skill, right, in an interview to kind of know. Now, it's possible also if you are here and you're coding and you're like, ooh, I don't know, I can't tell if he also likes, he just doesn't like lecture, period, or just Dr. Ray, you might go back to your interviewee and say, you know, I just need a point of clarification. If it's an important theme in your, in your paper, in your research um, paper, then you might want to go back to your participants and clarify. There's that member checking piece again, right? So that you're solid on, oh no, it's not just, it's not just Dr. A, every professor I, he doesn't like that shrink period. It's a lot more work, but it also points to, in the future when you do interviews, at the very end, leave it open. Hey, if I have other questions, can I come back to you? Can I ask you more questions? Maybe it's a quick email or a phone call. You don't have to go sit with them again for an hour, right? Maybe it's just a quick email. Hey, you know, you had mentioned that, someone, that you hate when Dr. Ray lectures. Is that just Dr. Ray or any professor, right? So then you've cleared it. Does that make sense? So there's different ways to slice this data, right? You can say games for games, 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 or don't give me games. There, you then have to tease it out. Now, did someone have a theme that they came up with? Um, I think we, we kind of broke it down into, I guess, two different, uh, I guess, and I guess uh, we were looking at it as a category, mm -hmm. active learners and passive learners. Ooh, okay. So active learners, passive learners. Okay. So I would maybe say active learning, right, as, a, as an idea, and passive learning. Did the participants ever say active learning? Were those words here at all? Where did that come from? Where'd you come up with those words? Uh, just by looking at the different, um, I guess, the different binary that, that emerged from that. That there are you know, people who like lectures and content, uh -huh. and other people who like clickers and games and group work. Uh -huh. Okay, so active learning strategies is an idea, right? It's a more abstract idea. Guess what? It's written about all in the literature. So if you are studying uh, student engagement, you're likely reading the literature on what engages students. And you might come up with this concept of active learning or active learning strategies. The participants may not ever say that, probably won't, because it's an abstract concept, right? But you, because you've done your literature, you have a theoretical framework, perhaps, that active learning strategies are better <laughs> than passive, lear passive learning, right? So now you're applying that as a category that subsumes these different codes into them. So there's a sense of category, and what's the theme there? So we have active learning, passive learning. Those are at the level of two, if we go back here. That's here, right? So lecture, small group, clickers, those are all here. Active learning, passive learning is here. So Let's go up to three. Yeah. How do we move up to three? She has, she has a question. Do you want to take her question first? Or oh, sure. Do you want? Okay. Um, so, going from is on. There it is. Yeah. Um, going from level two to number, or level three, would it be, um, when thinking about themes, is it? I think it cut off. Maybe the other microphone. Just talked out. Yeah. No? Oh, it kind of cut. Yeah. Use the other one. So when going from a category to a theme, is it considering how the category applies to the research question? Is that kind of how? 
Great idea. Yes, absolutely. The research question has to shape what themes you come up with, right? And so, like in the other uh, graphic that I had, the category might not be part of, might not, might, it might not develop into a theme because it's not relevant to your research question. Now, in the graphic, I was showing multiple categories helping you with one theme. We're kind of doing it in an artificial way, so most likely we're, we're only going to have one category. So, so yes, absolutely, that's an important consideration. What are my research questions? Can I move from this to the theme, which is helping me answer my questions, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so I guess to answer your original question, one of the themes that her and I were considering was that small group work like would facilitate engagement. Because ah. we looked at your research question, which was like, what, uh, what do college students believe facilitates their engagement in courses? And then our kind of category that we were considering was small group work or something of that virtue. So what we are kind of pulling from the data is, you know, with this data we think small group work is, or something like that, is facilitating engagement. And maybe we could even use the other category of active learning, active learning strategies, um, facilitate engagement. Do you see how we jump from category to theme? We just did that. Do you want to ask a question? Or comment? No, no, I just came up uh, with a different oh. word. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Was it the battery? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just came up with a different word. Uh, kinesthetic activity leads to engagement. Okay, kinesthetically active, so something that actually makes them use their bodies. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Instead of just like sitting passively. Yes. Would that be a theme or would it be in category? Um, if it's if you're coding, um, so that would still be a category because it's a label, right? We move to a theme when we say when students are kinesthetically engaged, they are more engaged in class, right? I, that, I always remember when I, I was researching here at um, the lab school here, uh, first and it's kinder and first grade science, and they had the students get up and use their bodies to represent uh, solid, liquid, and gas. Now we know there's a fourth state of matter plasma, but that's the point. Um, but so when they when they said solid, the kids would stand like this, and then when they said liquid, the kids would go like this, <laughs> and then when they said gas, it was chaos. <laughs> it was like oh, kindergartners and first graders running around, right? So that's so that you might label that observation kinesthetic active learning, right? And so I would I would say that that's more of a code. When we move up to ah. They're more engaged when, blah, right? That moves us into a pattern or a theme. Mm -hmm. Or more people are talking about being engaged when they are doing active learning. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just. Oh, uh, Mike? I know, sorry. sorry. I would too if I wasn't standing right in front of her. <laughs> oh, <laughs> who gets to it first? <laughs> Uh, 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 classroom activities. There you go. Classroom activities. That is a category, okay. right? So games, maybe? Uh, Group work? Exactly. Yeah, so your label can be different from his label. Totally fine. Does it encapsulate the idea of those codes? Yeah, classroom activities would be a great uh, category. Not a theme yet. Okay, what? That was my question because it relates to the research question. What do first year college students believe facilitates their engagements in their courses? Right. So you, activities would be a component of that. Right. So you might say um, the majority of students believed that engaging them in classroom activities was much more engaging, or okay. uh, having them do classroom activities was much more engaging. Okay. So themes tend to be like phrases or full sentences, right? Whereas the code, a category, a category code is a label still, right? Yeah. It's still at that level within the data. Does that help? Yeah, that makes sense. Great idea. Yes, back to you. So the way I'm understanding this is, the, uh, is as you go up the model, mm -hmm. you arrive at more specificity as far as uh, trying to Prove your 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 research topic. 
Well, maybe to answer your research question, research I would like question, to stay away from proof because yeah. we never quite prove. Right. Now, in terms of specificity, you're more specific to your research question. So I would say that. Your data is definitely much more specific. It's at the discrete level. So when you are moving up, you're combining all these ideas into something more general. So that's where I would hesitate maybe with the specific, the word specific. But I, I see where you're going, which is that you're moving towards an answer to your question. Whereas when you're in the weeds, it's like that first photo of that tree. There were tons of trees there, right? And if, you're, if you've ever been in an orchard, it's like a bunch of trees everywhere, right? You can't discern one from the other. It's only when you stop, pick it, and look at its component parts, and then build it back up that you start to see the themes. So yeah, absolutely, as we move up, we're moving closer to answering the research question, but our ideas are, are a little bit more general and more abstract, because now we've moved away from the particular data. Does that make sense? Yes. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you for a clarification um, because um, my group and I, I did it, we did it as um, categories, as um, internal and external. So um, internal would be things like, I like the professor, the content. Um, ah, good. Yes. And then um, we did like external, like games, clickers. Um, and then the theme as motivation. Are we going on the right track? What a great idea. A totally different way to see the same data. Totally different way to see the same data. Absolutely. There are some things that are kind of like <coughs> internal to the person. I'm intrinsically motivated, right? Because I just love the content and I love the professor. And those are, those are about me, yes. right? And then there are the things that the instructor might do. So you might have a binary where you have the things that are about me the things are about what the instructor does yes. in the class. Perfect. I love it. Different way to slice the data. And by the way, if your theoretical underpinning is about motivation theory, that's probably where you're going to go, right? As opposed to if you're if you're studying uh, pedagogical or andragogical strategies that an instructor might might have, right? So pedagogy is the art and science of teaching kids, right? Andragogy, the art and science of teaching adults. So you, if that's where you are then you might go with the active learning strategies. But if your mind and your theoretical framework is about motivation, then you're probably going to go intrinsic, extrinsic, maybe. Mm. Great, great. Thank you for <coughs> adding that. All right, so just because there are no right answers, right? Interpretation is not an exact science. Don't forget that. There are no right answers. You just have to defend what you're saying with illustrative evidence from the data. Right? You have to make sure to say, oh, see, when he, he or she says this, that's an example of this concept. That's why I coded it that way. As long as you do that, you're good. All right, so just an example, here's what I did. I said, oh, small group clickers and games, they are kind of the same thing, right? They're engaging in some kind of classroom activity, right? Lecture's its own beast. I like my professor is separate, content is separate. Now, if I were to go with this group, I might put, I like my professor and content together, right? There's no right way of organizing. This is just how I did it for the purposes of demonstration. And I actually went where you all went. Active learning strategies are present. Active learning strategies are not present. Again, not the only way, not the only category, but that's just where I went. And if we look at the graphic, it looks something like this. We're going back to what he was saying about the plus and minus, right? And what you were saying about games, not so much. Games, yes. I have active strategy plus, active strategy minus, because your codes, you want to make them as small as possible. Don't make them long sentences, because you're going to be coding that. <laughs> you don't want your margins to be longer than the actual text. So active strategy plus, active strategy minus. And if you notice here, I started with an idea about small group and lecture. Those were the two things, those are the red ones, right? Those are my a priori codes. I kind of knew I was already going to code those things because the literature talks about small group work versus lecture. But then when I did my, my research and all these students talking about clickers, what are clickers? Games? You play games? I didn't know that. Those are emergent codes that I added. That's why they're the blue ones. All right, so then moving up to theme, pattern. Number three, here's what I just wrote. A lot of discussion on what the instructor does during class that helps the students engage. So going back to your point about intrinsic versus internal to you versus what the instructor does, I went to what does the instructor do, right? 
also because I that's kind of what I think about all the time, right? Because I'm an instructor, what should I do better, right? Um, the second bullet is, while one student talked about, oh, I think two people did, sorry, that's a typo. While two students talked about the benefits of lecturing, the majority of students believed active learning strategies were more effective in engaging them. There's my theme, right? So I've moved from games, clickers, lecture, to active learning strategies, number two, to back to your point about now we're getting close to the research question. What's helping us answer the research question? That's what our themes are. Does that make sense? Now, Saldani I wrote with a few of his colleagues, Miles and Huberman, so there's a bunch of work that they did together, Miles Huberman and Saldani. They talk about the difference between an assertion and a proposition. An assertion is where you make, it's a sentence, and you say what the answer to the research question is. Like this, students self-reported being more engaged when their instructors use active learning strategies during class. That's a finding. What they say is if you're able to, I don't know if in five interviews you, you will be able to, but try. If you're able to, make a proposition, which is either an if-then or a because. So here's an example. The proposition might be, students were more engaged when active learning strategies were used because they felt a sense of ownership over the content being covered. I heard you guys saying um, contribution. They want to make some kind of contribution. That's what I was thinking, right? In the, in, the, in the way that they're talking, the students are talking about wanting more ownership. They want to contribute in the class. So that moves it to the next level of proposition. Does that make sense? Now, if you stay just at the assertion level, you're golden. That's fantastic. The next step, if you can, if your data allows for it, is to move to proposition. That's like gold standard, right, for qualitative reporting. Any questions? I believe this is like how you present it is going to be covered later, so I, I'm not going too much into detail about that, but just to show how the progression, where you move up the progression. Okay, and I don't want us to forget this, because I did hear some soft and subjective in the word cloud earlier in the poll. Qualitative researchers are not free to make wild forays into fancy. They make, but cannot fake. So it's not like you're making stuff up. You are interpreting. It's not an exact science. It might be the way that this last idea was or active learning strategies. But at the end of the day, you are using illustrative cases to make a point. Question. Um, I did have a, a question um, about when it comes to developing codes. Um, and I know we, um, I think Tanya mentioned earlier about the naturalistic way of transcribing. Um, are we able, are we allowed to as researchers to make codes off of those kind of nonverbal or uh, other things that aren't necessarily spoken in the interview? Great Let's say question. Like if there's something that, that you know about a person, like maybe a person's uh, social economic status, you know, and want to make the correlation between their opinions that you can kind of see the patterns, uh, are you able to utilize that for coding? That's a great question. When we do that, we are moving more into fuzzy territory. But if you take, for example, you all did observation, I mean, uh, interviews. But if you take, for example, observations, there's a lot that the researcher is coding that wasn't verbally said, right? So, so the answer is yes. The short answer is yes, that you do code things that aren't necessarily verbalized. But there is that other level of, there's, there's a grayer area there, so it depends how you're using that information. And so I would be just a little bit more careful, like if they're, you know, in there. So you, move, you use the example of SES, which is where I probably wouldn't go in terms of coding. I would use that more as context. So I would say, you know what, these five students, they're in a lower SES uh, bracket. These five students are not, and oh, how interesting that these five students talked about lectures as being the way to engage them, and these five talked about active learning strategies. Hmm, I wonder why. So that's more of like a context setting for you as you develop your themes, but that's, that's really important in qualitative research. You wouldn't necessarily code it that way, you would just know that 
when you have participants, and, and I'll show you Google Highlight in a second, when you parse out your data into, into particular codes, you might want to look for those things, those, those certain kinds of um, characteristics that may give you insight. Like, oh, well, women talk about needing, uh, you know, wanting to go into um, the arts and social sciences in larger numbers than the men. The men talk about being mathematicians and engineers, you know, just making something up. But you, the, the characteristics of the individuals can become important when you're developing the themes, okay. if that makes sense. Any other Thanks. questions? All right, I'm kind of over my time a little bit, so I just want to quickly um, show you Google Highlight. So if we go into our Google Drive, we are going to have, we're going to open up a Google Doc. So this is all the data that I gave you, right? Um, up on top, there's an add-on. It's very small. So under add-ons, you can go to um, get add-ons, and then you want the highlight tool. And I'm just going to demonstrate this to you, but maybe just drop down if you like it, how to, how to actually uh, get the highlight tool. So once you have the highlight tool, it'll show up in your add-ons in Google Doc. And you can, I've already started it, but you can then go and click start. And basically what that does is it gives you a code list gives you a section to have a code list. When you click on Highlighter Library, it'll open up a place where you can add codes. And that's what I've done. For this study, I actually added a set called Student Engagement Study. You can see that here. And I have the codes clickers, small group, games, lecture, content, and I like my professor. Now, you can see I've sneakily um, color-coded them, right? the way that I had organized them before with clicker, small group, and games in one, like green, they're different colors of green. And so because I kind of know, like those are the active learning strategies. So when you have that, you can go in, and I'm just gonna quickly demonstrate. You can go in and highlight a chunk of data and say, oh, uh, when the professor lectures. So when you highlight, all you do is you click. And it highlights that text with that code, okay? It's hard to see here, um, but that's what you do. So then I go here, oh, I like the professor, so that's this purple one, click away, and uh, I like when it's with activities, I'm gonna make that a small group, and this is clickers, okay, let's go with maybe one more small group here somewhere. Uh, oh, here, small group, okay, so we do that, small group, okay. And so on, right? Now, the cool thing about this, which is different from Microsoft Word, is that you can actually extract into another document that groups them together. So when you're actually looking at your data, what you would do is you come here, it says extract highlights down below, and you say by color, because those are your codes. All right, so I'm going to say new document, and then it'll extract. Maybe if you press that, that yeah. blue thing. Yeah, you're supposed to document. Was I supposed to? I'm sorry. Extract. There we go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ta da! Nice. <laughs> That's what I was after. <laughs> so now you can see, I mean, you. this is helpful because you might hear about small group work at the beginning of the interview, at the middle of the interview, at the end of the interview. And what this does is it just pulls all of those, the ways that you've coded them, into one place. And now you can look at all the greens and see if there's any more need to disaggregate, to tease it apart, or maybe you need a new category because there, there's some things that are different about that that aren't just about small group work, etc. So it helps facilitate that behind the curtains coding process. All right? That is all I have for you. So hopefully this is helpful. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Um, my, my, I, like, I feel like I learned so much Yay. from your talk and all like the research programs I did. Um, my question is, I was wondering, you mentioned that usually like folks come into research with some kind of like thoughts about it before. Um, so I was thinking because the last research um, project I did, 
um, I use the framework of grounded theory. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it. Um, just to reiterate for folks that may not know, it's like pretty much like they use it in like qualitative research and it's like this theory that like you come in and then like you don't come in with the theory and then you make up a theory right. with it. What do you think about that thematic framework because you mentioned that it's not really possible to do that. Yeah, good. Thank you. Really good question. So grounded theory is this like really exciting approach to doing research, qualitative research in particular because it is about generating theory really, really inductively. Now, most qualitative research does that, right? Uh, but grounded theory is really about not coming in with preconceived ideas. The whole idea is that you're really being inductive, so you're letting the data speak for itself. Um, what I like about this, the piece that you had to read, the Brown and Clark piece, is that they talk about a lot of the research out there being grounded theory light, mm -hmm. which is that you know it's really hard to do grounded theory the way it was initially conceived of by Glazer and Strauss. So the idea is that you would need, you need a lot of time because the approach that they advocate for and the sort of general um, that they've um, developed is that you would go into the field with a question and you would look at what you have there in the field and then you would make an assertion to test. Then you would come back out and you think about that assertion and then you go back in and test it. So you go back in and do more data collection using now this, this inductively generated idea to test. And if that pans out, great, you've got illustrative examples and evidence for it, fantastic. Usually that's not what happens, so then you're like, okay, what's my next idea? Then you come back out, you think about the next idea, what it could be, then you go back into the data to uh, to try to test it again. So it's a very inductive, deductive, moving in and out. It takes a lot of time. In fact, um, I have a funny story uh, about my dissertation work right here at UCLA. I did my dissertation work in the School of Education here. And I remember proposing to do a grounded theory approach. And I went in and I was going to be in the field for about a year. So this is like a year-long ethnography. Um, and about two weeks in, I had 150 codes and I didn't know what to do. I was so stressed out. I was like overwhelmed. So I called my chair and I said, I had two chairs. I, I called one of them and I said, I want to cry. And I was, I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm only like two weeks in. And he kind of chuckled. And he said, yeah, we kind of knew you were going to get here. Um, it's OK. Let's go back to your theoretical framework and start to think about codes that you can apply. The idea being that. It's not impossible, but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work to get to a place where you're really inductively coding the data and generating theory. And so what tends to happen is a lot of people like the approaches analytic um, idea, which is to the constant comparative method, but it's rare to find studies that go in with, and, even, and I would even argue back to your question about, you know, I would even argue that it's impossible to go into the field with absolutely no idea of what you what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. We are human beings with experiences, and we have uh, feelings about things, right? So, and usually you pick a study that you care about because I'm gonna I'm, I'm guessing you've already realized that it's a tedious process. So you don't want to pick something you don't like. So you're gonna pick something close to your heart, right? And if it's, for example, um, microaggressions in the classroom context, because that's important to you, because you've experienced it, well, guess what? You're going to have an investment in it. You're going to have ideas about it. And so even if you don't look at the literature and you don't look at the theory, you've picked a topic that hopefully is interesting to you to sustain you. And so for that reason, you're going to have thoughts about it. So that's kind of like really broad moving back and I would even say quantitative researchers are the same they're they're no different they're human beings with agendas with ideas and the variables that they choose the things that they decide to test those are all framed by who that person that researcher is uh, but grounded theory the way to do it really really well um, it's 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 hard it takes time May I ask a second? sure follow up and then yeah <coughs> 
Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, my other question was I've been meaning to ask you because I learned by like examples because you mentioned about the orange tree and that's about research. So if it was um, like qualitative um, talking about the orange tree, then I would have just recruited a certain population, do a focus group like, hey, what do you do with this orange tree? But if I wanted to do a mixed methods approach mm -hmm. to the orange tree study, like what purpose does this orange tree serve? How would that look like? Would it be that I would have mixed method, meaning putting both, right? But then would it mean that I have to do a lot of focus groups, like a lot of, mm -hmm. I have to do research in a lot of trees to make it a mixed methods approach? Good question. So, so mixed methods, you, you want the qualitative and the quantitative components yes. to stand alone and to not stand alone in the study, but to have, to be well done in and of themselves. So yes. you don't want to say, I'm doing a mixed method, but you're doing primarily a qualitative and you're tacking on a couple of survey items, right? Yeah. That's not, how, that's not how, what I would think of as mixed methods. Mixed methods is really true to each approach, qual yeah. and quant. So in the case of, and that was just an analogy, but I'll make something up here. Uh, in the case of the orange tree functions, um, you might want to have a generalizable uh, way of looking at how, what the functions of orange trees are for, yeah. I don't know, um, young adults between the ages of 18 to, or yeah, we'll say 16 to 30 or something, right? So then you would sample that group of people and you would do a survey and you'd say, okay, very simplistic obviously, but uh, what do you do with an orange tree, right? And then you'd give them options in a very standardized way so that the quantitative part would have a large sample, you'd want to generalize to a particular population, mm -hmm. and you would ask in a very predetermined way. So you might not have climbing trees because that's not what the literature says, but you would have food consumption, you would have for timber, you'd have oxygen, and then you could have people pick and you know check off on a survey. So the survey would be the quantitative part because you have a large, large sample, you're trying to generalize, and you have standardized instruments so you can compare across participants, uh, respondents, comments. Then you might have focus groups where you tease out a little bit of a smaller sample, uh, purposefully selected, right? Because the idea isn't to generalize. Uh, we're looking for particulars in a qualitative study. And you might find specific people who have orange trees in their backyards. Right? So you're purposefully selecting, or you might find orange, um, and th those might include orange farmers, right? people who have orange orchards, um, or uh, we have a lemon orchard, but we have orange trees on the orchard. So maybe you pick purposefully, you pick people who have orange trees, and then you ask them, how do you use orange trees? In a focus group fashion, smaller sample size, yeah. purposefully selected, right? And then you're going deeper into it. So rather than being constrained by a standardized instrument, you might ask them, you know, tell me what you think of when you think of an orange tree. And let it be open to how they come to that question. So you could do you could mix those two yeah. to give you a broader sense as well as a deep sense of what is what is the function of an orange tree. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Um, Mike's, oh, there's one here with nobody. Sorry, I was trying to stand right here. I'm having trouble standing right here. Uh, as, like, kind of undergraduate students, how would you suggest that we familiarize ourselves with different theoretical frameworks? Mm -hmm. Uh, if that question makes sense, like I kind totally. of feel okay. One word, <laughs> read. <laughs> it's really the only way. I mean, uh, listen. Now we have such an amazing ability to get things, um, get readings, and get books digitally. That you, uh, I will say. Now I, I have the privilege of being at an institution. I have uh, USC's libraries at my disposal. Um, I'm sure that all of you probably will have access in your particular CCs, but when you go, when you move into a, a baccalaureate granting institution, you will have all of these resources at your disposal. And you, I always start with scholar.google.com. Now, it's not to say that uh, Google Scholar has everything. There are some journal articles that don't get posted in, in Scholar Google, but the, it's a great place to start. And so I would start there. 
and I'd figure out what are my keywords. If my study's on motivation, then I type in motivation, motivation and students, motivation and instructor, motivation and active learning strategies, right? So I'm, I'm going to start to really look, and oftentimes you'll get PDFs right there and then. I mean, I have the privilege of having a, a proxy, so wherever I am, I can log into USC's libraries, and oftentimes I can get the articles instantaneously. So there's no more, like when I was in college, I had to like, find it, and then ask my library to get it. Mm -hmm. I went to Occidental, so it's not like a research one university. Oftentimes they had to get stuff for me. I had access to everything, but I'd have to wait. Now we can get access to so many things without having to wait. And so the job then is for you to distill okay, which ones are credible sources, right? Peer review journals that are good journals that are you know, not just someone's blog, <laughs> but actual scholarly work. And that's why scholar.google is a good place to start. So once we like obtain access to a PDF, I guess then you would just look through that PDF and, and hope that the author is going to mention some type of different framework and then separately yeah. do some type of Google search on whatever, okay, motivation framework. Or... Precisely, precisely. So when you have the keywords and you find a variety of articles and you read them and you read the books, you start to see the same people repeating, right? Mm -hmm. They'll cite, you know, they'll cite the same people over and over again. So if you're if you're looking at sociocultural learning theory, Vygotsky will be cited, and then Vygotsky's followers will be cited, right? So you'll see the same authors being cited over and over again, and that's a cue to you. I better go find those authors' work, right? So then you go find those authors' work. And oh, there's a term for it, sociocultural learning theory. OK, I better search that. So then you have a new search term to start with. Uh, you can put quotes around it, right? Sociocultural learning theory. So you get that together. There's some tricks about how to search. But yeah, so it's kind of like a puzzle that you're, that you're figuring out. And um, it takes a lot of time to kind of master the literature. But you'll know when you're there, when you keep seeing the same people yeah. and the same ideas kind of popping up, then you know, okay, you've got it. And, and you can understand, oh, you know, there's different theories for learning. There's also social cognitive. And it's not just about the sociocultural theorists. And, you know, there is this debate going on about which one's the right theory. Oh, I better know about both, right? And then you decide, oh, yeah, but I still like sociocultural better. So I'm going to hook myself in there, even though I know that that's not the only theory, right? So it's a puzzle, it takes time, you expand your, your search words, your key terms in your searches, you find the best is what I call, what some people call the Pearl article, where it's like exactly spot on to your topic. And they are writing about everything you want to write about, everything you want to research, go to their bibliography page. Because that's your Pearl, like that's how you can get more readings, that's how you can find other things because this person who is doing a study very much like yours thinks that these other resources are really helpful for him or her. So they probably will be for you too. So it's kind of like a little cheat, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome. Um, so earlier I asked you about um, determining kind of um, like when we are doing explanatory research, it's harder um, to work within certain, um, like for example, with semi-structured interviews, you're not going to be doing explanatory research. More likely than not, it's going to be exploratory because the questions are open-ended, etc. So that being said, um, you're not determining like causal or any kind of like experimental things. Um, but I'm just wondering, can you include potential theories in like an explanatory way, not presented as fact, but like rather if you are finding certain like someone says, you know, I think this because of this, not presenting the because of, you know, X, Y, Z as a fact, but rather as like an emerging theory, if that's um, acceptable. You as a researcher saying, I see it this way because of? Um, more so, like, I'm just going to use my own research as an Let's example. <laughs> so I, I'm doing research surrounding stereotypes and identifying certain stereotypes. And like I've identified a few stereotypes that people actually feel very proud of and connected to. Mm -hmm. um, and other stereotypes people feel very threatened and distant to. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, now that I've gone down this path, I'm now interested in why, why the distinction 
and I've identified a couple reasons why through interviews, but I obviously can't present that as, as part of the exploratory research that's more explanatory. And so I'm wondering if I can include that without making that, you know, presenting it as fact or anything like that. So that's where propositions come in. And I think that we're probably using explanatory and exploratory maybe in slightly different ways. Um, what, you're, what you're describing sounds very exploratory to me. Okay. What you're saying is you've looked at the data, you've explored what the data has to say, and now you're generating theory from that. Right. That's a very overarchingly an explanatory, uh, exploratory approach, which is a very, it's very in line with qualitative research. And what you're saying, and you can say, they have allegiances to this kind of a stereotype because. Mm -hmm. That's where, if, we, if you remember, that's where the propositions come in, right? So I'm wondering, is, hello, okay. Is that like inappropriate to do as a researcher, like to, to present it as people feel connected to this, like because of this and just state it as fact? Like is that? No, that's, that's exactly your job. Okay. It's exactly your job. Now, you wouldn't stop there. You would add illustrative evidence. Right? So you would have interview quotes that need to go into your report. Without the quotes, it's just your word against nothing, right? So it's just your word. So the, the best qualitative researchers make interpretations that move us out from the particular to a general abstract uh, comment or theory, right? You're building, you're developing your own theory, your own proposition, but you have to back it up with the evidence. So that's where Google Highlight comes in handy because now, if, that, if you know that uh, this type of stereotype is empowering for someone, for example, you would go to those, co those codes and you'd pull actual examples from your interviews and then put them into the report. And you could say, oh, this type of people actually really want to keep having this stereotype being used for their, their group because they feel empowered by it. Here's an example of so-and-so talking about uh, being empowered by it. Oh, I love the model minority myth because it just it makes me look good, right? Uh, it empowers me to do better. Okay, as you can see from this interview quote, I'm still writing, right? I'm typing the analysis. As you can see from this interview quote, this person has a positive association with the model minority myth, okay? And so on. So that's exactly your job is to make interpretations and if you can move to that level of because, knowing that you have evidence to back you up, perfect. That's where we wanna. That's where we wanna go. Thank you. It might feel uneasy because <laughs> it kind of goes back to like, ooh, am I going into the interpretive black hole? But again, if you have enough evidence, you can stand behind those interpretations. Other questions? Really great questions, everybody. Fun. Anyone else have a question? That's not me. Please go for it. Earlier you were talking about how uh, like you were trying to prove yourself wrong. That's like something, like a technique you used internally to kind of keep yourself from introducing too much bias. Yeah. Do you have any other like mental like mm -hmm. techniques or things that you do in yourself to kind of, you know, bring the best information forward? Yes, another strategy is called reflexivity. So that's journaling. So I, I, I spend a lot of time, and I ask my students to spend a lot of time thinking about who they are as people, what they think, what their assumptions are. And so if someone says something in an interview that you're like, what? Like someone says, oh, model minority myth, yay. And you're like, oh my god, what's wrong with this person, right? Um, you would write that down, right? Because it helps capture your own assumptions and your own perspectives about, your own worldview, in other words. And by doing that, by reflecting, you're able to see, ooh, I've, and when you come up with a finding, when you come up with the themes, then you want to cross-check that with, am I saying this because of my biases? Because now you've written down your biases. You have a sense of where you are, and then you can try to check yourself, basically. It's, it's uh, what my chair used to call disciplining your subjectivity, right? You discipline your subjectivity in that way. Thank you. Great question. Um, okay, so for, for my research, it's um, I'm basically researching how community college students understand their educational plan to transfer. Um, how would you go about trying to like get information from them when you're asking them a question of how they understand it, pretty much, and they just say like, 
Well, I, well, I don't. Uh, and so I'm just there. I'm like, okay, what, what about this? You know, they, they literally don't know anything. Like, is it just, is that just an interview? Okay, that's gonna last five minutes and that's it? Or like, how would you go about like trying to like just pull information from someone? If they have, don't have like, they don't have a barrel to go, a base to go off. In the absence of something, right? So your question is, how do they understand it? The, the, for many of them, they don't. So it's yeah. the absence of understanding. And that's a really good question because it's hard to ask someone something that they don't know, right? So I wouldn't stop there. I would actually try to see uh, what their thinking process might be in trying to get the information. So I would be <coughs> in an emergent fashion because qualitative research helps us do this, allows us to do this, yay. So in an emergent fashion, I would say, okay, so you're not aware of it. Where might you go to access information? Uh, talk to me about conversations you have with your friends related to your plans for transfer. Talk to me about conversations you might have with a counselor. And, you know, oh, you haven't talked to a counselor. Do, um, tell me about uh, who, what resources are available at your community college, right? So I would probe deeper and try to get more information. Do they have a network that they talk to? Because oftentimes there's those informal networks where they get a lot of information that sometimes is correct, sometimes isn't correct. So I would go deeper. I, and I would, now that you have a sense that, well, I think you're done with your interviews, right? Um, can you go back? Well, I'm, I'm going to keep on trying to do more. Okay. But yeah, so. so then if you if you have the ability to go back and do more, now you know that I have no awareness is a potential possibility. And so now what I would do is think about what could you ask them that they would have been able to do or that they have done. So you might even ask them, tell me about the last time an instructor in your class, because you know they've gone to class, uh, talked about uh, the courses, where it falls into the transfer uh, plan. Or, and then they might say, oh, my instructors never talk about it. So then that's still data for you, right? But now you've specified it to, they have no awareness because their instructors don't talk about it. They don't even know that a counselor exists on campus. They don't talk to their friends about it. So you have more ability to dig deeper into the, I just am not aware. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Actually, Great, question. Great question. Great <laughs> question. Earlier, um, you kind of stated that when, like, going off of his question, um, when you're doing an interview, if you, after your interview is done and you have a, a question, you would, like, email your subject or whatever, your participant. My question is, when do you kind of stop following up? You know, when do you draw that line of, like, okay, you're an informant to, like, okay, I'm, I'm done, I'm going to actually, like, yeah. analyze? Because obviously, I would assume you don't want to go back and forth, like, five interviews, right? Yeah, and you'd want to be careful, right? Like if you know that there might be other questions that might come up, you might wait yeah. and just do one email or one phone call instead of like going back constantly, constantly. Now, it depends on your relationship with the people too, right? I spent a year in this high school. I made good friends with, I still text with one of the uh, women that was in my study. I know she's having her second baby. Like she, you know, so like I, I went to her wedding. Right? So it, it really depends on your relationship with the people. Like you could just be on a text, text basis. Um, but usually you're not. So usually you want to kind of wait until you have a set of questions that you'll then, now this was like years ago, right? Uh, that you'll then go back and say, okay, can I have a phone conversation with you? Um, and then in terms of when you know when to stop, there's no answer to that question that I can tell you. And you're like, oh yeah, that's when that's when our team has said to stop now. I've reached that and I can stop. Yeah. We talk about saturation in the qualitative methodology um, readings and writings. It's really when you know you've reached a point where you're not learning anything new and you can stop. So it's kind of like a gut feeling in a way. You feel like you've, and that's the same with a literature review. When you see the same people's names, when you see the same theories, and that's when you know, okay, I know it. I'm, I'm good. Do you know it all? Never. Right? The literature is way too vast. You're, you can dig deep and deep and deep into your participants' um, every word as many times as you want. So there is, there is a point of like diminishing returns in a way. So you kind of have to just know, I have enough for my purpose, and I can solidly make a, an argument and I have evidence for that argument. About you? Sorry, not black and white. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? If there's no others, we'll, take, we'll keep going. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess, like, I don't mean to shift the subject, but I think, like, everyone in this room is kind of, like, 
we're all social science interested people. Um, we all have various research kind of interests, and I'm wondering if you can kind of anecdotally share, you know, how did you confirm your research interest as you went through the course of your life? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I actually wasn't headed to a doctoral program at all. I was headed to a place like this, which where you're sitting, which is law school. <laughs> um, that was my trajectory in college. I was very interested in law. I was very interested in environmental justice issues, so I wanted to do public interest law. I interned at NRDC, and I loved it. Uh, we were able to use research to stop um, green diesel from taking over our school buses. So because of a case that I was a part of, we, um, we got the uh, California Air Resources Board to agree to moving to compressed natural gas. It was very exciting. And then somewhere in my last year of college, I, I realized that's actually not, it was too hard of a fight. <laughs> so I want to not do that. And I realized that the research part of that case was the part that was the most interesting to me. Now, that was like collecting particulates, right? <laughs> carcinogenic particulates from a school bus to see if they're how, how high the particulate level was. But there was something about the inquiry process that, that was exciting to me. When I, um, I was an anthropology major, so I was a very social science oriented, um, that was my trajectory. But I also wanted it to be something that was a field that I could make some, I could do, I could have some benefit for, right? So I chose education because Oxy is a very education oriented uh, school and I felt like if I'm not saving the environment, I've got to save the kids. <laughs> it's like one or the other, right? Um, so I, you know, but in terms of a specific research project, you kind of have to look at your own interests. And as someone who's an immigrant to this country, I was interested in immigrant issues, and I was interested in uh, feelings of affiliation to or disaffiliation from school. Those were the things that, those were the questions that just were, were swirling in my own head from my own experiences. Um, and I, I also became really interested in racial injustices throughout college and knowing that I hold privileges that I know a lot of my, uh, my, my American peers don't. And so my topic ended up being about Armenian students in particular, which is what I am, but it was, it was contextualized in the lar larger racial um, hierarchy that exists in the country. So it has to be something that you're interested in. It has to be something that um, means something to you. And that usually comes from personal experiences. Um, so to hone in on a topic, and then you have disciplinary uh, influences, right? So anthropology really helped me see the idea of like meaning is different for me and for you and for everybody. So how, a very constructivist idea. So I kind of like brought up justice and you know um, immigrant idea ideas and constructivism. I kind of brought them all together for my particular topic. But I'm a methodologist by training, so I actually have done research projects that run the gamut. So I, I worked in applied research for a long time, because again, of my orientation to make some kind of a change, rather than just do research that gets published that a small handful of people read. Um, I was interested in actually doing research to make change. So I worked in LAUSD for a while, and I did projects on all kinds of things like curriculum, in, curriculum implementation, professional development for principals, um, you know, and then at first five, I did health issues, um, safety issues for little kids, zero to five. So I used my tools, my methods tools, to apply to a variety of different topics. And there's a lot of work out there in applied research for that. So I'm, I don't see myself as a content expert. I see myself more as like content agnostic, using methods expertise to help apply to those more applied research context. That was probably a really long answer that you didn't care to hear, but. No, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any last questions? Yeah, take one more. Earlier you were talking about the mixed methods, and uh, you know, I, I'm doing the mixed methods, and you know, I, I, that boundary of uh, of like not jumping back too much like back and forth like you were saying earlier like uh, how can I balance that out like do you have any suggestions when in terms of, of like should I be structured and just do quantitative and go back and forth like that can I leap back and forth like like 
Um, um, if you're doing a true mixed method study, um, there's, a, there's a few different ways to do it. Um, and you could do the qualitative first, do all of it, and then do the quantitative next, do all of that. Or you could do them concurrently, where you do them at the same time. And either way, though, a true mixed methods approach, the, the benefit of it is that they do talk to each other. So at some point, you do want to see, like, oh, do the survey responses about the functions of an orange tree, do those jive with my focus group data? Or did the focus group data reveal something that wasn't there in the survey data about the functions of the orange tree, right? So you, at some point, whether at the, in the interim or at the end, those, the data from both of those approaches has to speak to each other. So I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and sometimes you do want to go back and forth, like, oh, my, my uh, survey data is telling me this. Let me change my protocol for my focus group to address that, because I didn't realize that, that that was going to be a finding or a theme. So then you can do kind of an emergent, and it just makes for a better, more holistic study. Thank you. Sure. I hope I answered your question. You did. Oh, one more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I did a lot of uh, like research projects throughout my time in undergrad, and I didn't know the importance of publishing mm -hmm. until maybe when I was at my last year of at my time at UCLA. I was also a transfer student, but uh, now I'm post I'm, a po I'm like post grad, and um, I was wondering what I guess. Because, yeah, I try publishing, but then it's really hard because sometimes, like, your advisor, they tend to be, like, hands-off. And publishing is, like, yeah, it's really hard. So do you have any advice? Maybe because sometime in the future I do plan to get involved doing public health research again in the process of publishing. Uh, good question. So I will, be, I will be the first to tell you that I don't, I don't publish. I don't publish my work. I mean, it's it's. I do have a few things out there, but only because they fell in my lap or they were interesting. Um, part of it is because of what you experienced. That um, you know, I had advisors who were phenomenal, but they were true qualitative researchers. It's really hard to do teamwork when you're doing qual, and so I didn't have as many opportunities to publish with them. And when you don't get into that practice, yeah. it's like a whole different world, right? And then I'm also, I don't like rejection. So <laughs> my friends who are like really well published are like, oh, you reject me, no problem, I'll take it here, you know? Um, and so I get a rejection, I'm like, no, you know? Um, and also, I think that my, my trajectory moved in a different direction. I wrote a lot of technical reports, but they were not published because they were for program staff. You know, I did I did work on curriculum in the in the um, in LUSD that went to the ELD um, curriculum staff to inform them. It went to the board. It went to the superintendent. Yeah. So those weren't things that I was publishing. But you know what? They were things that were making immediate effect in the field. Yes. Not always, because sometimes there's politics, right? But um, so so I think if you want to go that if you want to be an, a tenure track academic. That's when publishing matters. Yeah. And if you do want that, then I would say, even if you don't have an advisor who helps you with that, find a friend who's in that realm. So right now, my biggest advocates for publishing and the people who I actually get time to do that with are tenured faculty. Mm -hmm. So I have friends who I was in, in my doctoral program with. That's what they do. Like That's what they know how to do. And so they sometimes are like, hey, we should write something about this. Oh, OK. Let's do it. And then we publish them together because they know the world, they know the journals to pick, and all I am doing there is being a thought partner and writing with them. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to worry about the game, so to speak, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's only if you want to, if you want that trajectory. Not all people with doctorates want that tenured trajectory. In fact, I landed a full-time job as a, as a professor not because I was publishing, but because I had had a lot of applied research experience that was intended to inform practice. Um, and my profile at USC doesn't include uh, research. I don't have to publish to keep my job. Uh, it's a different profile. It's a, it's a clinical position. So my biggest job is to teach there. Um, but having had a lot of applied research background is useful in that context. So it really depends on what your aim is. And publishing is its own thing. You kind of need practice at it. So if you want to do it, you just do it. 
Yeah. Just go dive in, pick journals, submit, find their guidelines, submit stuff, get feedback. Sometimes the feedback from the reviewers is a great way to know how to make changes for another journal, right? So if they reject you, that's okay. Read their comments. I'm practicing. I'm not practicing what I preach, but um, <laughs> then go to the next one, right? Or find a friend who knows who does that work and publish with them. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, I'll take one more. Okay. How do you go about? Um, <clears throat> So when applying to grad school or like looking for a PhD program to go to, how do you go about finding um, a group of faculty that you'd want to work with? Because I feel like that's very hard. And I know that we had a, a podium too with um, where grad students were talking about. They were saying you'll never find a professor that does exactly what you want, right? Yeah. But how do you go about finding like a group of them? And how many would you pick to like work with you when you are a PhD candidate? That's a good question. I sort of, um, sort of luckily found mine, and I was so lucky to have found them. Um, I was lucky enough to go to a small liberal arts college where I would go to dinners with my professors and at their houses, you know. Uh, and one of them, who was a really close faculty member of mine, had a, his brother had a really good friend. And you know, when I started talking about graduate school and doing research, he said, "You know, you should really, we should, I should connect you to my brother's friend." because he's, he's a professor, he does this work, and he's at UCLA. So we had dinner. <laughs> this is like, I'm in college still, right? We had dinner with my faculty, my, my future faculty advisor, and that's how the connection happened. Sometimes it's really about the networks. Um, if you don't have that, so I, I never had the need to, to kind of shop around, but when I was applying, I didn't just apply to UCLA, I was looking at the people whose work I really liked, and then checking in with people who I knew might know them to see if they were cool people, right? So there's a lot of like really well-published people who you may not fit with, right? Their, their style doesn't work with you or they're not really as actively uh, engaged in supporting their students. And so what I would do is I'd say, oh, I love, like, I was like, I love Ray McDermott's work because he was a cultural uh, anthropologist working in education. And then I would ask, like, who knows Ray McDermott? Like, how is he as an instructor? And everybody was like raving about him. So I was like, okay, then I'm gonna apply to Stanford and connect with him, right? And so you, you wanna connect with the instructor that you want, or the professor that you want to be your ultimate chair before you go in. So that's the thing about doctoral programs. Um, most, of the, most of the social sciences, you have to choose the advisor. And if the advisor knows you and wants you to come, that's your ticket in, right? So if, you, if they don't know about you, it's harder to get into that program. Sometimes there's a master's to PhD. So I know in, this, in the ed school here, we have a master's program that if you like the program and the instructors get to know you and like you, then you transition straight into the PhD, which is how I actually did it. Because I actually wasn't sure about, not because of the instructor, but because of the program. Um, I'm a writer. Um, but, so I did the master's, it was a one-year master's. All the coursework that I took for the master's actually applied to the PhD. So I didn't lose any time, but that gave that one year gave the time, the opportunity for the instructors to get to know me, for me to get to know them, for me to get to know. So that might be another idea, is to look for master's programs that lead you into the PhD. But really it's about whose work are you liking and whose research makes sense to you. Um, if you want the tenure line track, then finding people whose research makes sense with your ideas is the way to go. And then reaching out to them, emailing them. And oh, if they don't email you back, that's a sign. Right? It means they're probably not going to be as responsive and, and mentoring when you get there. So, I hope that's helpful. I don't know, it's, it's hard because I kind of landed into a really perfect place. Um, and I didn't have to do a lot of like front work and leg work to, to get there. Would you say it was the same thing? Um, so going into a master's program, would you say it was the same thing as far as like the ticket in with the professor, yeah. or master's is that just PhD specific? Totally differently. Yeah. Usually, master's programs are like when you get into an undergraduate program. They're looking at your test scores. They're looking at your grades. They're looking at your personal statement. Um, there isn't a need to have you work with them. Right? Now, professional schools work differently. I, I teach in the uh, EDD programs at USC, and it's not the same as with a PhD. Because you have to understand, uh, when you're going into a PhD, you're usually like one or two of the students for that faculty member. 
and that faculty member is kind of responsible for seeing you through. With a master's, that's not the, that's not the case. You're not working with a particular faculty member, if that makes sense. It's a different beast altogether.